Welcome to the Air Distribution for Healthcare Facilities webinar featuring Matthew McLaurin. Matthew is the Titus Critical Environment Product Manager. He has over 12 years of experience in the HVAC industry and has been an ASHRAE certified healthcare facility design professional for six years. He is an expert on specialized equipment for operating rooms, laboratories, and clean rooms. Today's webinar is pre-recorded and is available on our website under the Titus University tab. It will also be available in our e-learning library within 7 to 10 business days. Certificates will be distributed to those who completed any one of the sessions we are offering this week. At the end of the presentation, Matthew will be answering questions that he frequently receives regarding this topic, and then we will begin the audience Q&A session. You are welcome to submit questions at any time during the webinar, and we will address them at the end. Now let's begin the webinar. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this course on healthcare design. My name is Matthew McLaren. I'm product manager for our healthcare, critical environment, and chilling products at Titus. Today, we'll go through some standards and guidelines around healthcare design, then we'll discuss the Wells-Riley equation and what it means to us as HVAC engineers. Then we'll look at air distribution requirements for different types of patient rooms. Then we'll conclude with operating rooms and wrap up with a couple of questions. Starting off, the overarching standard for healthcare facility design, ZFGI guidelines. This has been adopted as code in 42 of the 50 states. The other states that have not adopted the FGI guidelines either accept them as equivalent to their state codes, use language from the guidelines in their state codes, or incorporate them by reference. It's important to note that the FGI guidelines are under continuous maintenance to ensure that the building design and constructions meet the ever-evolving requirements for minimum care. The most recent edition of the FGI guidelines is the 2018 edition. This continues a major change that began with the 2014 edition, which split residential care spaces from hospitals and outpatient facilities. Now, hospitals, outpatient facilities, and residential care facilities all have separate volumes dedicated to unique requirements of those different facility types. Since the 2010 edition of the FGI guidelines, ASHRAE Standard 170 has been incorporated into the guidelines to address minimum engineering design criteria for HVAC systems. Since then, ASHRAE, ASHE, and the FGI guidelines have worked together to coordinate updates and change their standards. The most significant recent change has been the addition of sections 8 and 9 to ASHRAE Standard 170. These sections are meant to address the specific ventilation requirements for outpatient facilities in Section 8, residential care facilities in Section 9, while Section 7 refines its focus to just inpatient care spaces. Initially, the 2017 edition was released with Sections 8 and 9 having the exact same language as Section 8. Since the release of the 2013 edition, the committee has been working to update the standard to incorporate these specific requirements for each unique facility type. Numerous addenda have been issued to address these changes as well as continuing to update the standard to improve the minimum design requirements for all healthcare facilities. Next, we'll dive into the Wells Riley equation. This allows infection control practitioners and others to predict the chance of someone catching an infection from someone that has an airborne infectious disease, such as flu or tuberculosis or even the common cold. Using this equation, we'll first consider the number of infectious individuals in the space, then the generation rate of the particular virus of disease that those individuals have. This is called the quanta generation weight, which is a number used by epidemiologists to quantify the amount of virus or disease that is aerosolized over time. Generation rate will vary between the types of infection, activity level of the person, and the point of time during the infection, and it can even vary dramatically from person to person. Other considerations in this equation are the breathing rate or pulmonary ventilation rate. Noted here is the typical rate for an individual that is seated and moderately active. We must also take into consideration the duration of exposure within the space, and ultimately what we have as an impact from an HVAC engineering standpoint is the room ventilation rate. This value is the only one in the, in the denominator. It has a pretty significant impact. 
In order to get an understanding of how significant of an impact ventilation air has on the spread of airborne diseases, we'll do a quick example. For this, we'll use the Titus training room. It's about 1,400 square feet. Typically, we have about 25 occupants, and our classes are about an hour long. For simplicity's sake, we're going to say that it's served by a DOAS system, so it's 100% outdoor air. And we'll also consider it's maybe colder flu season. Just as kind of a, a reference, this space is pretty similar in size to what you would expect for a small ER waiting room. And so in that case, you might have three or four people who have the flu that are waiting to get treated. For this example, we're saying that four people of the 25 have the flu. If you do the ventilation rate calculation for ASHRAE 62.1 based on the square footage and the number of people in the space, you get just under one air change per hour. We solve the equation to get the percentage of infection. We see that almost 55% of the occupants have the high probability of contracting the flu based on this simplified equation. Now, in comparison, we can increase the air change rate to 12 air changes per hour, like what you'd see in an ER waiting room. Also, like in this example, you have 100% exhaust in the outdoor waiting room, especially since this example uh, with the training room was done with the DOAS system. So if we increase that air changes to 12 total air changes, you see the infection rate drops very significantly to less than 6%. The other thing that we can do as HVAC engineers to help reduce the spread of airborne infections is filtration. The basic wells riley equation I showed didn't take into consideration any filtration of the outdoor air or recirculated air. Studies have been done to review the impact of filtration on HVAC systems to prevent the spread of airborne infection. So to begin this discussion, let me give you some background on the research that's been completed regarding the generation of viral aerosols. Several studies have found that respiratory aerosols aren't just generated when we cough or sneeze, but are also generated during normal talking and breathing, which account for 80% to 90% of the time viral aerosols are generated. During talking and breathing, that particle size is in the 1 to 2 micron range. When we cough or sneeze, that particle size decreases pretty dramatically into the 0.3 to 1 micron size range. And also, as you would expect, the volume of viral aerosols generated at the same time are dramatically increased during episodes of coughing or sneezing. So one of the things that the CDC and other studies have shown is that aerosols and particles that are less than one micron in size remain airborne for way more than 12 hours. In order to begin filtering out these potentially infectious aerosols, we need filtration in place that's going to effectively remove these smaller particles. So if we look at this table, we can tell that only MERV-13 and higher efficiency filters are relatively effective at capturing particles that are less than three microns in size. So it's just referenced particles that are generated as viral aerosols are 3 micron down to as small as 0.3 micron. And so if you look at this, at least a minimum of MERV-13 is required to have any chance of filtering out those smaller particles. A jump to a HEPA filter, and you get pretty close to 100% efficient at removing those particles, even down to that 0.3 micron in size. So this ties into a study that compared filtration efficiency to the risk of infection. This study used the air change requirements for several space types, their typical occupancy, and several different airborne infectious diseases such as influenza, they used tuberculosis, and they used the rhinovirus or the common cold. They looked at this hospital case, which is done in the ER waiting room we just discussed, as well as in an office setting and classroom environment as well. As you can see the chart for the flu here in this ER setting, you can see the significant decrease the risk of infection as you increase your filtration levels. And that kind of tapers off, especially once you get to a MERV-13 with little return beyond the MERV-13 for reduce in chances or contracting an infection. This next slide compares the relative cost impact of the higher efficiency filters. It clearly highlights the trade-off of increasing filtration efficiency when compared to the previous slide 
you can see that the difference between risk of infection and operating costs. Once you go above a MERV 13, the operating costs don't increase dramatically until you get to the HEPA filter when then there's a significant jump. The main factor of this is filter pressure drop. So you're going to increase your fan energy cost. The increased cost for the more efficient media. The one thing that you see that does go down is labor cost. Uh, lower efficacy filters typically need to be changed more often, increasing the maintenance cost. So going from a MERV 13 to MERV 14, the cost isn't really significant. But if you look at the jump from a MERV 14 to a HEPA, it's pretty substantial. As we will discuss later, there are only a few places that will require HEPA filters due to the critical nature of the patients in these spaces per ASHRAE standard 170. Next, we'll take a look at some of the different types of patient rooms. General patient rooms, like a single bed patient room you see here, have some fairly basic requirements. The ventilation requirement is four total air changes, with two of those air changes being outdoor air. Design temperatures are pretty common with a range of 70 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Maximum humidity level is 60% RH. And then the pre-filter upstream of the cooling coil needs to be a MERV-8. And the final filter downstream of that cooling coil needs to be a MERV-14. One thing I want to touch on here is the importance of the relative humidity. We have the upper limit here of 60%. There are a bunch of studies that have shown that relative humidity levels above 60% can increase the reproductive rates of bacteria and microorganisms and viruses. And we don't want to encourage that. So that limit makes a lot of sense. However, recent research has shown the importance of also maintaining a lower humidity limit. And studies suggest that should be maintained somewhere around 40%. As I mentioned previously, when people cough or sneeze, or even when they're just talking, respiratory aerosols are being released into the room. Those aerosols are typically fairly small, but those that are larger than the cube microns will drop quickly onto the surface of the bed where they can be washed with the linens or onto the floor or countertops where they can be easily cleaned and disinfected. However, when relative humidity levels are less than 40%, and someone coughs or sneezes, those particles that are shed desiccate very quickly or much more quickly than was previously anticipated. Once those particles shrink to a small enough size, they can remain airborne anywhere from 12 hours to 40 hours. And then there's the other aspect of the impact of relative humidities below 40%. Once the humidity levels drop that low, the body begins to dry out pretty rapidly. As you dehydrate, one of the first things that is affected is the protections of the respiratory system, specifically the cilia and mucus in our nose and throat. As those start to become less effective at preventing particles from getting into our lungs and respiratory system, that increases the chance of infection. So it's really a twofold impact. One, the body is more susceptible to contracting an airborne infection. And two, the viral aerosol concentration is higher as the respiratory aerosols desiccate much more quickly. And in effect, like I said, it's really a double whammy that can lead to increased spread of infection when humidity levels are low. Now we'll look at room air distribution for these patient rooms. We should be focused on supplying minimum airflow rates while maximizing comfort. There's numerous studies showing that patient comfort is directly tied to the duration of stay, and so the more comfortable someone is, they will recover more quickly. So that's why we're really looking to maintain a comfortable space with our air distribution. It's going to have a pretty big impact on how we select and size diffusers for most spaces. For patient rooms that don't have a heavy solar load, we can typically use one or possibly two 24 by 24 inch diffusers. As you see on the upper left-hand corner, we've got a three-cone diffuser. On the right-hand upper side, we have a, a plaque-type diffuser. Any square diffuser would work in these cases. However, you want to make sure that you have one selected for the range of airflow rates you're supplying so you don't have dumping and you're well mixing the room. For rooms with higher solar loads, like the bottom two pictures, probably are going to need 
a perimeter diffuser as well to help handle those loads, whether it's a high solar load or a high heating load in the winter. The bottom left picture shows a arrangement with two four slot diffusers. In this case, two of those slots are throwing out across the ceiling for when the room is in cooling. The other two are throwing down the window. Now, this is 100% of the time, so you're splitting the air 50-50. It's the 50-50 compromise. The downside of this, one, the room's not going to be mixed as well as it could be otherwise. So the room space is not going to be as comfortable. You'll also have an energy penalty as well because you're not mixing the room as effectively as possible with your air distribution choice. It's going to take longer to get to set point. So that's going to have an impact on the energy usage in the space and then also how quickly you're able to achieve comfort for the patient in the space. If you look at the bottom right-hand side, this space is using an auto changeover diffuser that puts 100% of its airflow either horizontal across the ceiling for cooling or vertically down the window in heating. And you get that same benefit that you would with a well-mixed system in either application. In cooling, you have that 100% horizontal throw. It's going to mix the room well, get to set point faster. In heating mode, you're going to have that vertical throw throwing down the window, rolling the room from the bottom. You're also going to reach set point much quicker. Uh, our studies have shown that you'll get to set point 30% more quickly. That means the patient is comfortable sooner. And then you also decrease any of your heating load or heating requirements for the space as well. So another type of air distribution system that can be used in patient rooms, specifically in single bedrooms only, is displacement ventilation. They have slightly different requirements from your patient rooms that are using traditional air distribution methods. In this case, they require six total air changes and two outdoor air changes. However, the volume requirement for that isn't the full height of the room, but from the floor to the six foot level, as this is a fully stratified system. There are a couple of unique stipulations for displacement ventilation rooms. One for the room exhaust, that needs to be placed in the ceiling or in the sidewall next to the head of the bed. That comes from some studies that were shown that we'll look at here in a minute, detail why that's the case. The other is the toilet transfer grill that needs to be above the six foot level. The reason for this displacement ventilation, it pours out onto the floor. As you can see in this slide here on the left, uh, that low velocity air will pour out onto the floor and spread throughout the space. If you have a low level toilet transfer grill, the toilet space is negatively pressurized with 10 exhaust air changes. And so that will pull that room air into the toilet space and exhaust it before it can provide cooling to the space. So you want to avoid that, hence the requirement for the transfer grill to the toilet being above the six foot level. The second aspect that I talked about is the room exhaust. You want to have it on the ceiling or high on the sidewall above the bed of the patient. On the right hand side of this slide, you can see a plume of breath or coughing or sneezing coming off a patient. So it kind of shows the isovel of the airflow coming off of the patient itself. And we want to try and remove any particles that are released in the space as efficiently as possible. So you can see how it kind of pulls up on the ceiling and kind of creeps out into the space itself. So ideally, we want to have the exhaust grill from this space be placed somewhere between a foot and a half to two feet away from the wall in the ceiling. That way it can capture as much as contaminants as possible and remove them from the space. Since this is a stratified system, anything that rises up to that ceiling level is just going to drift around the room until it happens to make its way back to the return or exhaust in the ceiling or the high side wall, depending on where it's placed. And we want to try and capture anything that's released from the patient, especially as quickly as possible. Here we have a rendering of a displacement ventilation system in a patient room. The displacement ventilation unit you can see in the bottom left-hand side of the screen underneath the, the TV and the the shelving unit there, it's painted to match and blend in with the cabinetry. Uh, this is a pretty 
typical approach for use of displacement ventilation in an application such as this. You can see the exhaust there in the middle of the room next to the observation light. And then there's another one that serves as a transfer grill to the toilet just above the clock above the toilet space door. Energy usage within healthcare spaces is significantly more than traditional commercial buildings. They consume 9% of the energy used in the U.S. for the built environment, while only making up 2% of the square footage. Approximately 50% of the energy used in hospitals is consumed by the HVAC system. A significant portion of that energy is zone reheat, which you can see here on the left. In most cases, this is necessary to prevent overcooling from the high prescriptive ventilation rates. As healthcare systems work to reduce their energy usage and carbon footprints, reducing the amount of energy dedicated to zone reheat through the use of room recirculating units is one way to make a significant impact. One of the ways to combat that is to use a recirculating unit in patient rooms and any of the other spaces that allow for use of recirculating units. This could be chill beam, fan coils, PTAC, VRF even. Some of the requirements for use of a recirculating unit within patient rooms or any of the other spaces where recirculating units are allowed. You still have to provide the minimum outdoor air changes in a patient room. That's two outdoor air changes. You still have to say the same level of filtration that you would on that supplier like you would if it was an all air system. So a MERV-8 upstream of the coil and a MERV-14 downstream of the coil is the final filter. As far as filtration for the recirculating units themselves, if it's a condensing unit like a typical fan coil or VRF, PTAC, you need to have a MRFSEX filter. If it's a non-condensing surface like you'd have with a chill beam that's a sensible only coiling, there's no requirement to have a filter over the coil itself or upstream of the coil. So next, we're going to look at the energy benefit that you get from going from an all-air VAV system to a room recirculating unit that is sensible cooling only. If we take this example here, you've got 300 square foot. Your ventilation rate for a 10-foot ceiling in this space, you have two air changes, so that's 100 CFM. The recirculated air changes through the air handler or in the space, the minimum is 100 CFM. So your total air changes are 200 CFM. The cooling load in this particular space we'll assume is 20 BTU per square foot. So right at 6,000 BTU. We do the calculation for sensible cooling requirements to manage the design load. That's going to require 280 CFM. So first we'll look at the VAV design. In this case, you have a 55 degree supply air temperature. You're supplying your minimum 200 CFM. So that's that four air changes you see coming into the system, into the room. Then you're going to be exhausting four of those air changes or returning four of those air changes back through. Two of those will be exhausted and the other two will be recirculated back through the system. So with your minimum flow at 200 CFM, maximum flow at 280 CFM, you've got a cooling range without adding any reheat between about 4,300 BTU and 6,000 BTU. It's only about a 28% turndown. If we consider an active chill beam design, 65 degree supply airflow temperature, this would be because you have another wheel, a dual wheel system, so you can optimize the design to minimize the amount of reheat and also maintain humidity levels in the space with the lower amount of supply airflow that you're providing. So you have your two incoming air changes at 65 degrees. You see the eight air change arrow, that's the induced airflow rate from the chilled beam. So you have even more air changes in the space than would be required. You're exhausting your two air changes and it's full exhaust since you're bringing two air changes into the room and two air changes out of the room. So 100% in, 100% exhaust. So you see maximum airflow is 100 CFM. Minimum airflow is also 100 CFM. So if we look at the cooling range with or without free heat, the air side side of it is just over 1000 BTU. With the cooling coil, incorporated, we go all the way up to 6,000 BTU of cooling. 
at that same 100 CFM of primary airflow. It gives you an 82% turndown. So that gives a pretty significant turndown and range to eliminate parasitic reheat. So in this slide, we're going to do a side-by-side -side comparison of a conventional VAV system at 55 degrees supply air versus DOAS system with an active chill beam supplying 65 degree primary air. At design condition, the all air VAV system is going to supply the 20 BTU per square foot of cooling, and that's about five and a half air changes. The chill beam system is going to supply its two outdoor air changes or four BTU per square foot and the remaining 16 BTU per square foot is going to be done with the recirculated air in the room flowing over the sensible cooling coil. As the cooling demand drops, the all air VAV system can only turn down to about 20% of its full supply load. So that's the four air changes. Anything beyond this, it's going to have to add additional reheat, that parasitic reheat that we've talked about and mentioned to prevent overcooling in the space. The beam system, as you see here, is still supplying its two outdoor air changes, and the balance of the cooling load is being handled through the sensible cooling coil and the induced recirculated air in the space. If we go all the way down to the minimum for the chill beam system. You can see it's completely shut off the water, just supplying the four BTU per square foot which is 20% of the design load, and that's an 80% load reduction without adding reheat. And if you look at this comparison, you've got 14 and a half BTU of cooling being supplied by the VAV system, and another 10 and a half BTU per square foot of parasitic reheat. This system is supplying 21 BTU per square foot of additional energy usage that's not required as compared to the chill beam system design. Here you can see a couple more examples that you can see it. It graduates down as the, the load in the space ramps down to a lower set point. You have the increase in parasitic reheat with the all air VAV system and then the chill water on the chill beam design just slowly dials down until you're just supplying the minimum ventilation air or outdoor air requirements. So here is one of the big case studies around active chill beams in the US. It was one of the first projects that was completed after ASHRAE standard 170 revised its requirements for recirculating units in patient rooms. The big thing that you can see here down at the bottom is cooling savings and fan energy savings. These are pretty typical of any chill beam system compared to all our VAV system. Just general cooling energy savings and fan energy savings that you would expect in any application of beams. The big one that you see down at the bottom, which is specific to hospital applications, is that significant reduction in reheat. That's at almost a 90% energy savings on the reheat that they got. And this isn't a wild, drastic comparison. This is 96 beds in a new tower that was built on this existing campus that had around 400 beds. So it's same site, same location, same weather, same basic air handler concept and design. And you can really see the impact of going to the active chill beam system or a recirculating unit in this space. Part of that energy benefit comes from being a sensible only cooling coil. There's people who are hesitant to go from maybe a fan coil or induction unit setup to a chill beam design. We see more and more often spaces being retrofitted or refurbished with their fan coil units that are in place, updating their fan coils or refurbishing their fan coils, but then changing their water system design from a condensing system with 45 degree water to a sensible only coiling system in their fan coils. And it's a nice option in place of going to a chill beam system. You'll have increased maintenance requirements, increased sound levels, but the trade-off is still that you're going to be able to significantly reduce your reheat energy in those spaces as well. So one thing that would be remiss to point out, this system that built that hospital, they are continuing to use active chill beams throughout 
all of their new patient tower designs primarily because of this data that you're seeing right here related to comfort. If you look at the existing campus in that first column, they had almost 500 beds and they had just over three complaints per bed per year about the comfort in the space due to temperature. If you looked at the, the new tower, those went down to less than three quarters of a complaint per room per year, which is a significant reduction. So I mentioned earlier, patient comfort is one of the key things for helping reduce daytime, increase recovery, and improve patient morale as well. So this one reason is why they are continuing to move forward with chill beams as their, their main design for any of their new buildings. One of the other things that was mentioned in their case studies is that they saw a reduction in infection rates. One of the common concerns of using recirculating unit within a patient room is you are not exhausting or removing the same volume of air that you would be with an all air system. So introducing four air changes and removing four air changes with the all air system, where with a recirculating system, you're bringing in two air changes and exhausting two air changes from the space. So the duration of exposure to a viral aerosol or an infectious aerosol is going to be much longer. So the chance of inhaling that and be acquiring infection would be higher. This has really shown that there was no increase as a result of using the active beam system versus an all air VAV system. And they just wanted to highlight that. Not saying the reduction was associated with that, but just there wasn't an increase because of the use of recirculating units in these spaces. The next type of patient room we'll discuss is a protective environment room. These rooms are for patients with compromised immune systems, organ transplant patients, cancer patients, HIV patients. In this case, we're trying to prevent spread of disease from the staff and visitors to the patient themselves. One of the ways that is attempting to do that is with the increase in ventilation. We went from four total air changes to 12 total air changes. You saw the impact that that had previously on our quick example in the operating room. Bases can be positively pressurized. So you're trying to prevent migration of particles from outside the room to inside the room to prevent the patient from acquiring an infection. Temperature and humidity requirements, again, are very the exact same as your standard patient room. However, for any of these protective environment rooms, highly recommend to design your system where you can add humidification to increase that or maintain that minimum humidity level at 40% or higher, if at all possible. Filtration requirements, your pre-filter needs to be a MERV-8. Your final filter for these spaces needs to be a HEPA filter. The protective environment room and the combined protective environment room are the only space within the healthcare facility that require HEPA filtration. Part of that is, again, there's the associated cost of the filter itself and the pressure losses associated with it, but it's not worth the expense of a patient with an immune compromised system becoming infected with a airborne pathogen. So we're going to try and prevent that as much as possible. The other part of that is the air distribution that we have in this space. So we need the group E non-aspirating diffuser. This is going to be your laminar flow type diffuser. As part of this, we would highly recommend from a system design standpoint that you have point of service HEPA filters in these spaces. So in those laminar flow diffusers, have the HEPA filter rack with HEPA filter included uh, over the bed. That's the requirement for the location of those. However, and I can't stress this enough, you do not want to have all 12 air changes coming into the space right over the patient. Maybe have one or two diffusers supplying two thirds of the air changes or a third of the air changes, and then another diffuser off away from the patient itself supplying the remainder of the air changes. Part of that is, as you can see here, patient is not going to be very active, so his MET rate can be pretty close to zero. 
he's wearing a very little amount of clothing, the, the hospital gowning. And so his flow rate can be very close to zero. That volume of air, even though it's going to be a low temperature delta, even that at that velocity that you'll see at the bed, it could be very uncomfortable if you're bringing all 12 air changes in over the bed itself. So we want to avoid that if all possible. The next type of room we'll discuss is the airborne infection isolation room. These are meant to stop the spread of infection from the patient to those around him. In these rooms, we also have the higher total air change rate. You have the two outdoor and 12 total. The one thing to note that since this space is negatively pressurized and it's a hundred percent exhaust, the requirement for those air changes is based on the exhaust flow rate. So in this space, you need 12 exhaust air changes. So based on the volume of the room, your exhaust flow rate needs to be enough to achieve 12 total air changes. The supply air changes needs to be enough that you have the offset required to achieve that negative pressurization between the corridor and the space itself. Same temperature and humidity requirements. Ideally, again, lower humidity level maintained at 40% or higher between the 40 and 60% range. That way, any of the droplet and viral aerosols that are generated when someone coughs or sneezes don't desiccate and remain airborne for the extended period of time. Filtration, Mervate upstream of the main air handler coil. MER 14 is the final filter. Air distribution types in this can be either group A or group E. The exhaust grill needs to be above the patient, either on the wall near the head of the bed or on the ceiling. So we discussed with displacement ventilation option and the ceiling about a foot or two out from the wall is probably ideal. And depending on the type of air distribution you're using in the, this case would be appropriate as well. So we'll look at a little bit more in detail in the type and placement of these devices. So here you have a typical layout. In this case, we have an ante room that would be highly recommended for these spaces. Uh, you have a one-way radial throw diffuser that's going to throw towards the bed located on the wall opposite from the foot of the bed. So you are going to have an airflow direction that flows from the left side of the room and displaces and diffuses towards the right side of the room over the patient. And that will be exhausted through these two grills you see here on the sidewall. So I said they can be placed on the sidewall here or in the ceiling, ideally about a foot or two out from the wall. Part of that is this diffuser type. It, like I said, it's, it's a non-aspirating type diffuser, but it's a radial throw pattern. So it's gonna push into the room, displace the air, around it and so it's going to create a path of air that's going to flow over the patient and then up to where it can be exhausted and removed from the space. The pressurization requirements and this goes for both the protective environment room and the airborne isolation room. You need that minimum pressure differential whether it's positive for the protective environment room or negative for the airborne isolation room between the corridor and the room or any other adjacent rooms that are different room type. Asheray Standard 170 allows for a combined PE AII room. So this would house either someone that has a compromised immune system or is suspected of having an airborne infectious disease. Most of the requirements just get compounded together and added. You have the 12 total air changes. 100% exhaust because of that requirement. The 12 air changes are exhaust air changes. Pressurization is required. Again, now in this case, you must have an ante room. That ante room can be positively pressurized to the corridor and to the isolation room, or it can be negatively pressurized to the corridor and the isolation room. We definitely, as best practice, recommend a positive pressure isolation room, commonly referred to as a bubble type anteroom. This is because you are 
maintaining that separation between the two spaces with that positive pressurization. You're not allowing for particles to migrate into that space. With a negative or sink type anteroom, you're actively drawing particles from the isolation room as well as the corridor into that anteroom. And you risk the transfer or migration of particles into and out of the, the two spaces if you don't have a sufficient time interlock on the doors, which doesn't always make sense in a healthcare type setting. So we definitely, as I said, recommend the bubble type, positive pressure, the bow space, anteroom. Temperature and relative humidity are the same. Again, try and maintain the lower end of your relative humidity at 40% or higher. If you have the MRF-8 filtration upstream of the coil and your final filter needs to be a HEPA filter. Again, you also have the air distribution requirement of grouping on aspirating. So the laminar flow type product. We also recommend like in the protective environment room, including those with point of service HEPA filters and not placing all of those over the bed. The exhaust grill is like what you had in the airborne isolation room where you have the exhaust grills either on the wall near the head of the bed or in the ceiling above the patient. Here you have the example with the anteroom. So the minimum hundredth of an inch pressure differential is between the corridor and the isolation room and the isolation room and the adjacent spaces. So you have between the corridor and the anteroom and the anteroom and the isolation, there's no minimum differential pressure across each of those two boundaries. The total just has to be the hundredth of an inch. That being said, a hundredth of an inch has been proven through several different ASHRAE research projects is not enough to prevent particle migration in even one class of difference of air cleanliness. In these isolation rooms, ideally we're looking for about two classes of difference between the air outside the room and the air inside the room. As you can see in this middle column, if you got the door closed, the ASHRAE research really recommended four hundredths of an inch, so four times what the minimum requirement is in order to prevent particle migration. And that even goes for one class of difference. The column on the right indicates whether or not there's a need to include an anteroom. And as you can see, there's a note that not required if operation is not frequent, so less than 30 times a day. In these cases, a hospital setting where you have a nurse or a doctor or visitors coming to check on a patient throughout the day, you're more than likely going to exceed that 30 times in and out pretty easily. And so in all cases, best application is to include an anteroom and then include a separate door on the side. That way, these isolation rooms can be used as standard patient rooms with the airflow requirements dialed back. That other door can be locked off in times when these spaces are used as isolation rooms and then be quickly converted from a standard patient room to an isolation room by just increasing the airflow rates to the design conditions and requirements for those spaces. Last, we'll move on to operating rooms. One of the biggest changes in recent years is the definition of what an operating room is within the FGI guidelines and standard 170. This change was done in the 2014 edition of the FGI guidelines and the 2013 edition of ASHRAE standard 170. I, I mentioned this because there are a significant number of states that use the 2010 edition of the FGI guidelines and even older as well. The main change here went from classification of A, B, and C type surgery spaces based on the type of anesthesia that was being applied to being defined as an invasive procedure or a non-invasive procedure. If it's an invasive procedure, that has to be performed in a room meeting the requirements of the operating rooms. If it's a non-invasive procedure, it needs to be done in a procedure room. So that's a big change between the type of anesthesia that's being applied and then the type of procedure 
that they're now using. So depending on where you live and the code that's been adopted by your state, you may fall into either category, one or the other. So you want to be cognizant of that. For the air distribution requirements, standard 170 requires supply diffusers within the primary supply diffuser array to be grouping non-aspirating. The non-aspirating diffuser unidirectional airflow. It's going to be downward into the room, and it's going to have a minimum level of entrainment. That means the air motion that's generated in the space outside of the flow of that diffuser is going to be very low. You're not going to have airflow join and mingle into that jet coming out of one of these diffusers. So it's not going to mix into it. The additional supply diffusers that it allows are Group E, mounted in or near the ceiling that project air primary vertical down into the space. This is a pretty broad description. And what's really intended by this is the surgical type air curtain. One of the other stipulations within standard 170 is that diffusers used in operating rooms have to have a face that can be removed for easy cleaning. And so your typical diffuser that would meet this requirement or grill of group E aren't really what's intended. It's a surgical air curtain type diffuser is really what is intended by this additional supply diffusers. For filtration in operating rooms, you need a MERV 8 filter upstream of the coil. Uh, MERV 14 downstream. One of the things that's recommended as a best practice beyond the minimum requirements of standard 170 is to use point of service HEPA filters in the diffusers that are above the operating table. This would be very similar to what we recommend for protective environment rooms where you do have the requirement for HEPA filtration, but it doesn't have to be in the diffuser. Put using the point of service HEPA filter ensures that the cleanliness of air coming into the space is as high as possible with the level of filtration so it hasn't picked up anything moving through the ductwork and then into the space itself. Now we'll address the general requirements for operating rooms. We have an increase in the air change requirements. We've doubled our outdoor air change requirements from the other spaces we've discussed from two air changes to four. The minimum total air change requirement is now 20 air changes. We have a positive pressurization requirement of a hundredth of an inch. And like I said previously, ideally you're going to main around four hundredths of an inch to prevent particle migration into the operating room itself. The primary supply diffuser array is the area of the table plus the 12 inches beyond. In that area, the primary supply diffuser array, no more than 30% of that footprint can be non-diffuser use. So you have to have at least 70% diffuser coverage. Ideally, you're close to 100%. Airflow coming out of the diffusers is 25 to 35 CFM per square foot. You don't want to get that confused with discharge velocity or velocity at the table. That's the airflow rate per nominal square foot of the diffuser. For a 48 by 24 inch module, that's eight square feet. You have the 25 CFM per square foot. It's going to be 200 CFM. Where 35 CFM per square foot is going to be 280 CFM. Temperature requirements for the operating room space is going to be 68 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. You need to have individual temperature controls in each space. From a temperature standpoint, you really need to be able to get the operating room temperature down to about 66 to 67 degrees. That's really going to be ideal for maintaining comfort of the surgical staff and to meet any of the requirements from a temperature control standpoint that the surgeons may have for their procedures. You need at least two low sidewall return or exhaust grills as well. One of the things that I had mentioned on the previous slide and had underlined as well is the size of the primary supply diffuser array. Part of this is a change that was made going into the 2017 edition where we redefined the requirements for coverage 
within the operating room over the table itself. Previously, the primary supply diffuser array was made up of, had to extend at least 12 inches beyond the table and any of the diffusers in that. So all of the diffusers you see here would count towards the full size of the primary supply diffuser array. In the layout that you see here, there's no coverage over the table. And then the one area next to the boom adjacent to the, the rails, that area within the total diffuser array size was less than 30%. So this complied with the language in the standard previously, but not the intent in the standard. So we revised the language to prevent that from happening. With this, you have your operating table. The primary supply diffuser array has to extend at least 12 inches beyond the table. And then this area within this hatched region you see here, no more than 30% of that area can be for non-diffuser usage. So if we look at a conventional layout, and this space is just under 600 square foot, so we'd need almost 1,700, just around 1,700 CFM to meet the 20 air change requirement. So we want to maximize coverage over the patient. You can see we've placed three diffusers over the table as best as possible with the obstructions that are there at 30 CFM per square foot, kind of right in the middle of the airflow requirement. Those three diffusers gets us 720 CFM, which is not enough to meet the 20 air changes. So we'll need to add additional diffusers in the space to satisfy the air change requirement. So adding those four additional diffusers gets us to just at 1,680 CFM, which meets our 20 air change requirement. However, this is kind of, like I mentioned, a conventional layout. You see there are space between the diffusers that allows for these to be installed into a JIP board ceiling with structural support above so the diffusers can be secured and attached to the structure. The downside to this approach is the distance between the actual perforated face of each diffuser. There's about a three quarter inch border on the diffusers, and then you have the perforated face. So if you have that three quarters of an inch to an inch on each diffuser, so that's two inches overall between two diffusers, and then a four inch gap, you have somewhere around a six inch gap between the active sections of the laminar diffusers over the table. And around the table that as that airflow comes down into the space it'll create a pocket of negative pressure and that minimum amount of entrainment will pull airflow into those pockets and now even though the individual diffusers aren't aspirating the way the surgical array has been laid out in this case these airflow of the sterile field it has aspiration happening within it, which you don't want to have occur. Beginning in the 2010 edition of the FGI guidelines, they allowed for what you can see down here in the appendix is a central diffuser array. It doesn't have to be part of the monolithic ceiling. So within the diffuser and lights and boom area over the table and around the table, you could have a gasketed grid system that brings the diffusers much closer together and allows a much tighter layout. So you see here, while it's not all the same size and shape of diffuser, we've got them spaced much more closely together. We have more dense coverage over the table and help to provide a better uniformity of flow coming down into the space and prevented any aspiration of that ceiling level air into the sterile flow. The next thing I want to talk about with operating rooms is the research and findings from RP1397 that was completed several years ago. They went into several operating rooms during surgery, took measurements and temperature measurements, recreated that operating room in their laboratory space, did testing in their laboratory to refine and validate their CFD studies that they then went on to execute. One of the things that they found in both their in-situ testing and their CFD studies is what you see here, that as the airflow comes down into the space, 
instead of coming straight down in a uniform pattern, the airflow collapses in towards the center of the table in both the directions. The top field, you're looking down the length of the table. The bottom view, you're looking down the width of the table. And the two tall figures there in the middle are the surgical team. You can see at a fairly low delta T, 2 degrees C here, almost 4 degrees Fahrenheit. So not realistic for this small of an operating room to meet the 20 air change requirement with this and maintain a low temperature in the space. But you can see the field collapse. You still have decent coverage over the table, over the surgical staff. However, if you exacerbate that and go to a higher temperature delta, like what you would need in this small room to maintain space temperature, as well as to achieve your 20 air changes, you see a significant collapse in that airflow, an increase in velocity over the table. And as we mentioned, you're going to have a minimum amount of entrainment. If you look at the top image in this slide, that airflow is coming down and over and across the shoulders and neck and head and then down onto the table of, of the patient. When the doctors are in their surgical gowns and equipment, the most exposed part of their body and where they shed the most particles into the environment is in and around their head, neck, and face area. And now we're having entrainment of room air right over those that part of the body and then down onto the table. So it's not ideal at all. There are a couple ways to combat this that the RP1397 found. In this CFD study, you can see that there was a boom in the middle of the diffuser array. If you eliminate that boom in the middle, it prevents the collapse from happening as much. The main part of what they attributed the collapse of the sterile field to was the effect of the buoyancy of the colder air as it accelerated into the space. And since you're not inducing or entraining or mixing room air into the, the flow of the diffuser, there's nothing to reduce the momentum as it enters into the space. You have both the buoyancy of the air and gravity working against slowing the velocity down into the space. The removal of the boom in the center of the diffuser array helped to reduce that. The other thing they found was adding a physical barrier the further the physical barrier came down around the diffuser array, the less of a collapse occurred. And then what we found in our research is using a surgical air curtain helps even more than either of those options. You have the surgical air curtain that does two things. One, it prevents the collapse of the laminar flow sterile field over the table and over the surgical staff. So it prevents any of the issues with the collapse and airflow coming over the shoulders and head and neck of the, the surgeon and then onto the operating table. The other benefit that the surgical air curtains add is that it prevents any of the particles that are have come down and washed out over the table and out to the rest of the room from getting back to the ceiling level and being pulled into that sterile field like we saw with the traditional design layout. Because this high velocity jet of air, now it's blowing down and preventing those contaminants from being entrained along with them. Last, we'll briefly address hybrid operating rooms. The FGI guidelines requires all invasive procedures to be executed in spaces that meet the requirements for operating rooms. This means rooms where both imaging and invasive procedures are performed, they must meet the same requirements as operating rooms. The most difficult aspect of meeting the operating room requirements is obtaining proper diffuser coverage within the primary supply diffuser array. There's a significant increase in the amount of equipment and monitors that are suspended from the ceiling near the operating table in these types of rooms. Tables are also typically longer than standard operating tables requiring even more diffuser coverage. In this room, there's a floor mount C arm. This style device helps to minimize the ceiling space required by the equipment allowing for more adequate diffuser coverage. Here in this image, we have a hybrid OR with the ceiling mounted C-arm. Anytime that you have the ceiling mounted equipment, it's going to be even more difficult to get the right amount of ceiling coverage. As you can see in this picture, 
the black lines that are moving across the bed and over the table, those are ceiling mounted unistrut rails to help support the equipment. In most cases, that is going to take somewhere between 28 and 30% of the primary supply diffuser array around the table in these rooms. So it makes it critical to work with the imaging equipment manufacturers and air distribution manufacturers at the outset of your designs for your ceiling mounted hybrid ORs to ensure adequate coverage over the table. With that, we'll take some time to answer a few common questions that we get. The first question we've got is how can you convert a standard patient room into an isolation room? This, this one is relatively simple if it's handled at the design phase. In most cases, either protective environment rooms or airborne isolation rooms or a combined room, typically those are designed so that they can be operated as a normal occupancy space when they're not needed for either the protective environment rooms or the airborne infection room usage. In those cases, when you go from standard room to patient room or isolation room, you increase the airflows appropriately. You've used the right distribution and return and exhaust locations already. And so you just adjust the flow control and still maintain pressurization in those spaces. Going from a standard patient room to a protective environment room, it, it will prove pretty difficult, primarily because of the requirement of having HEPA filtration in the supply air diffuser over the bed itself. If you don't already have that set up and installed, the change out can be pretty cumbersome. Converting a standard patient room to an airborne infection isolation room it is a little simpler. There's a, a couple different options. One would be to shut the return damper back to the air handler so that it's 100% exhaust, increase the supply air flow rate where you're meeting your 12 exhaust air changes. You're probably going to have to increase your supply air change somewhere to around 10 air changes. The other option is to use a reverse flow fan filter unit and have that ducted to the return and have dampers change so it's 100% exhaust. That's gonna help offset and achieve the 12 exhaust air changes. And then you just increase your supply airflow to match that so you're maintaining your negative pressurization in the space. Like I said, that could be connected to the ductwork that's existing. It could be ducted out through a window or through a wall. So it's some temporary work done. So it's exhausting outside, but still meeting the requirements of ASHRAE standard 170. The next question is, should you use laminar flow diffusers with filters in operating rooms? The, the short answer there is yes, absolutely you should. It's always ideal to have HEPA filtered supply air in an operating room. That's going to help Minimize the number of particles that are potentially coming into contact with the patient. Part of it is you're diluting the airflow or the air in the space with clean air as you're returning and exhausting that and then bringing it in through a HEPA filter. As I mentioned, ideally, you're using a point of service HEPA filter. Uh, that way, you know the air coming into the space is as clean as possible. In some cases, that might not be practical. Uh, and because of the change out maintenance requirements. So the next best step would be to have a terminal HEPA filter module in the hallway outside that serves the operating room in their main branch duct. That would be another option as well. The next question we have is in regards to isolation rooms, specifically airborne infection isolation rooms. The requirement in the AII rooms is for 12 total air changes. There's also the 100% exhaust requirement. Why is the total air change requirement and outdoor air change requirement not both set at 12 since you're 100% exhaust? So that, that's a pretty straightforward example. The 12 air changes, as I mentioned, for the negative pressure spaces is based on the exhaust flow rate. So you need 12 exhaust airflow changes. The outdoor air change requirement 
is driven by the ventilation rate requirement that we have. And then the additional air can be come from areas that have been recirculated through the rest of the floor or area that the air handler is serving. But once it comes into the airborne isolation room, that has to be 100% exhaust. So you can supply recirculated air into an airborne isolation room, but then you just have to 100% exhaust. That's why you have the two outdoor air change requirement and 12 total air change requirement, and that's why they're not the same. The next question we've got is in regards to the use of air curtains in operating rooms. It says, the use of an air curtain in an operating room looks to be a good way to prevent the collapse of the laminar airflow field over the table. But won't we also entrain particles from outside the room to inside the sterile field, possibly contaminating the surgical site? Well, with the way that the surgical air curtain works, the velocity that we have is typically about 250 to 300 feet per minute as discharge coming out of the slots of the air curtain, depending on the design. That's going to be enough to prevent any particles from migrating outside the air curtain to inside the air curtain and then possibly into the sterile field. The other thing that we do is the recommended design is to have the air curtain placed between 24 inches and 36 inches away from the laminar flow diffuser. That way we can prevent the air from blowing down the back of the surgeons and causing turbulence where particles can come into the sterile area, the work area, as well as to have that separation from the air curtain in a laminar flow field so it doesn't disrupt the laminar flow coming into the space as well. Thank you, Matt. There was a lot of great information in this presentation. Now let's get started with the Q&A session. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box and we will respond in the order in which we receive them. We'll give you a moment to enter your question. <laughs> 